The 1939 film The Wizard of Oz is a classic of cinema. You don't need me to tell you that. But was heartily the first attempt at adapting L. Frank Baum's fantastical world. Today on Journey Through Cinema, we will be looking at some of the lesser known attempts at adapting the Oz novels, starting all the way back in 1914 with the three part trilogy The Patchwork Girl of Oz, The Magic Cloak of Oz, and His Majesty the Scarecrow of Oz, sometimes titled as The New Wizard of Oz. In 1914, the author of the original novel, The Wizard of Oz, and its sequels, L. Frank Baum, would try to go at it alone and make it into the film industry by founding his very own studio called the Oz Film Manufacturing Company. Now, this studio had the single goal of producing family-oriented entertainment, but it would have to start from the ground up. Now, Baum was counting on being able to leverage the popularity of his Wizard of Oz franchise to hopefully make this an instant success. The films themselves were all made on this shoestring budget, even for the time. And honestly, even back then, they looked cheap. All of them have this really, really just crappy donkey costume, and it looks like they just picked it up from, like, a costume shop on the way to the set. Or they, I don't know, like, stole it from a church nativity pageant or something. It's, it's bad. And they really like this donkey costume for some reason. It's in all three films, and... I don't know why this character wasn't from the books even. They just, if you bought that costume, may as well use it, right? In these movies, you can find them and they're mostly complete, but some have some missing scenes with gaps that need to be filled with intertitles. Now I'm gonna be discussing all these movies in full, including spoilers, so just fair warning from the beginning. Interestingly enough, Baum would not start with his most popular and famous first novel, The Wizard of Oz. Instead, the first film released would be The Patchwork Girl of Oz, an adaption of a later book in the series. For this film, the plot involves a magician trying to create a patchwork slave using a potion he's been mixing for six years. Unfortunately, there's this munchkin named Ojo, and he gives her a little bit more brains than her creator had hoped for, and she becomes truly alive. An unfortunate byproduct of her creation is another potion is spilled on bystanders. Ojo's uncle, the magician's wife, and the magician's daughter's lover. When these three come in contact with this other potion, they all become petrified into stone. So I guess, whoops. <laughs> and so since the magician can't bring them back to life without another potion, he takes his daughter, Ojo, and the patchwork girl and sets out on an adventure to collect the ingredients and basically turn the petrified humans back to normal, right? So. Standard fairy tales, storybook fair. So this eventually leads to our heroes being captured for picking a six-leaf clover and forced to stand trial before Ozma of Oz and her three royal jurors, who you may recognize, the lion, the scarecrow, and the tin man. The magician arrives, and with the help of the patchwork girl, he was able to procure the items needed to heal the petrified humans. And then once everyone is cured, everyone is, you know, freed from the trial, despite the fact that their actual crime was for picking the clovers. It wasn't for, you know, turning people to stone, but whatever. As said before, this film is chock full of really bad costumes and effects, even for the time. Aside from the donkey mentioned before, there's also this cat that looks like it was made out of, like, a collection of cardboard boxes, and it shoots, like, fire from its mouth. <laughs> It's great. <laughs> and despite this being specially made for children, some of these effects and scenes do look like there's some sort of nightmare fuel. Like one example is being they end up in this place called Hopville where everyone hops around on one foot and they see they have two legs and they think, ooh, I know, we need to amputate one of your feet so you can move around properly and hop. So kind of a dark and terrifying concept. And the titular patchwork girl herself is something pretty terrifying to behold and looks like she jumped out of a horror movie. Though the nimble actor does his best to bring the energy to the character with cartwheels and minor acrobatics, it doesn't distract from the fact that it looks like something that would sneak through your window at night and murder you in your sleep. It's also pretty clear that the patchwork girl is played by a dude, but that's kind of another matter and it's it's fine, it works. And speaking of people in other gender roles, the munchkin boy Ojo is played by the female actress Violet McMillian, who appears in all three of these films and is kind of almost the lead star. Although I will say in this case, it actually did confuse me for a moment because it took me a minute to realize that she was supposed to be playing a boy. At this time, 
films still thought they could get away with stagey gimmicks like having girls play young boys, despite the fact that this camera is much, much closer to the actors than, say, somebody who's watching a play from back in the audience. Because you're way closer to the subject, it kind of gives the game away. And it feels like they didn't do enough to try and make her look more like a boy child. Now, yes, most of the effects and costumes are bad, but I don't want to say all of them are. There's some rudimentary stop motion here and there, uh, such as the building of the patchwork doll or the magician conjuring a room and breakfast that looked shockingly decent. And this whole sequence is probably one of the most interesting in the film. You didn't see a lot of animated movies at this time, so you could really buy into the effect. Now, there's a lot of liberties taken with the source. Personally, I didn't notice them as much because I'm not really that familiar with the story. It's not like I've gone and actually read the book. But there are changes that are significant to anyone who has, such as there's no Dorothy or the wizard, and large parts are missing from the novel. Some characters are added, like the donkey and this laughable character called the Lonesome Snoop, I think. And he looks absolutely ridiculous. It, it looks like somebody in a Puff the Magic Dragon costume. In the end, it's a very stripped-down version of its source material. It can still capture at times that irreverent, bouncy nature, but at other times is very unintentionally horrifying. Now, the second film is The Magic Cloak of Oz. This one is based on the book ZZ of Oz, I think. This one was probably the strongest of the three, I'd say, yet has the least to do with any of the Oz stories outside of the intertitles that mention that there's these fairies that are apparently from Oz. Besides that, it could be its own standalone story if it wanted to. And that's almost to its benefit because this one keeps things very simple and easy to follow as this straightforward fairy tale. It begins with the fairies I mentioned before, and they're creating this magic cloak that they're supposed to give to the most unhappy person in the world. They end up finding a girl named Fluff, who has been left to be raised by her widowed aunt and forced to leave her home and move to the new kingdom of Noland. Now, Noland is kind of this sad city that has recently lost its king and is now without an heir. She is found by the fairies, and they give her the cloak and tell her that it will grant her one wish as long as she wears it. She wishes for one thing, to be happy again. Aww. And yes, as soon as they enter the city, sure enough, her brother Bud is named king through some weird legal loophole that the city randomly picks a new leader by just choosing the 47th person to enter through the gate. In the words of Monty Python, not the best system for a stable government. And sure enough, as soon as Bud is made king, he starts making these ludicrous laws like anyone afraid to go out in the dark should wait until it's light, or anyone who, like, owes money should continue to own money, I guess? Which, I guess, that one actually sounds pretty fair. If you do owe money, you should probably keep owing that money, maybe? Don't want to get political. I'm in dangerous territory here, I know. <laughs> but again, you find these weird, dark moments that I don't think the makers intended, like him threatening to execute his aunt for disciplining him in the past. Kind of just a little dark. But also, maybe that's the point, because maybe I think he's supposed to be, like, high on the power or something? Anyways, meanwhile, Queen ZZ of Z? Queen ZZ of G? I, I honestly don't know. Anyways, Queen ZZ is this witch who is over 600 years old, but appears as this young, beautiful woman. Only her mirror shows her to be the old hag that she is. When she somehow hears about the magic wishing cloak, honestly, the kids weren't being that subtle with it, she plots to steal it and wish her reflection to look as beautiful as most people see her. So see what I mean? A nice, simple fairy tale concept. And it even makes use of some very, very basic effects, such as looking into a false mirror with, like, one actor being young, the other one being old. It, it's simple, but it works. It's effective. Eventually, she is successful in stealing the cloak from Fluff and Bud, but she can't actually make any wishes because she attained it dishonorably. So she kind of just throws it out, you know, this all-powerful magic item that anyone could use to make anything possible. Kind of an idiot. Now, while the cloak's away, Nolan comes under attack from this group called the Roly Rogues. And this is where the film finds itself getting into that irreverent silliness that the Oz brand is known for. 
They really only attack Nolan because they want some fresh soup from the city, or they want a unique soup, or they really like the soup. They want the soup, okay? So Bud and Fluff then have to go off and recover the cloak in order to defeat the Roly Rogues, and they find it with an old woman who has cut it up and sold pieces as, like, a necktie. In order for them to get the cloak to work again, they need to find the last piece so that the cloak can be complete in its magical circuitry, I guess, works. Meanwhile, the uh, crappy donkey costume has to gather up all the other crappy animal costumes and lead them on the rebellion against the Roly Rogues. The movie ultimately ends with the cloak completed and the weird Gorgon Ninja Turtle looking Roly Rogues being run off. The fairies finally arrive and they decide, hey, we're going to take back our cloaks because the humans are too irresponsible and stupid, I guess, to be trusted with it. Which, uh, let's face it, they were. In the short time that the humans had it, they had left a object with godlike powers unguarded, they had thrown it out like trash, they had cut it up into a necktie. Morons. They were all morons. So, but at the very least, Bud gets to have at least one last good wish, and he wishes to be a good king. So I guess, hey, there's that. So much potential wasted. The movie really benefits from feeling standalone. It doesn't rely on the audience's knowledge of the books as much as the other two films do. It still has the same weaknesses of the cheap looking sets, but the simple fairy tale structure is surprisingly effective. And I also like how you don't actually ever know if the magic cloak was actually magic at all. And I think in a fun way that kind of connects back to the themes of the 1939 version of The Wizard of Oz. But let's get to the final film of this trilogy with His Majesty the Scarecrow of Oz. In this one we meet up with King Cruel, which is, it's cruel with a, with a K though. So, no, it is cruel, but it's, it's cruel. You get it. Anyways, King Cruel commands his niece, Gloria, to marry a courier named Googly Goo. But who would want to be married to someone with a name like that, especially when she is in love with their royal gardener, Pawn? He orders Pawn arrested, but Gloria helps him to escape. Meanwhile, Dorothy, yes, that girl from Kansas, is somehow now back in Oz and enslaved by the Wicked Witch. Don't ask me how or why, they don't give any context or any kind of hint of what's going on. This is the only movie out of the three where Dorothy appears, played by Violet McMillan. So the king ends up coincidentally going to the witch and asking, Hey, could you destroy the love between Gloria and Pawn? She kind of obliges. She actually ends up just freezing Gloria's heart entirely. And then she ends up summoning all her minions. Dorothy flees with Gloria and they meet up with the Scarecrow, who falls in love with Gloria, and then the Tin Man, who also falls in love with Gloria. I guess they couldn't help but fall in love with her bored, vapid face. And poor Vivian Reed, who plays Gloria. For most of the movie, she is stuck just kind of standing there playing like this vegetable. But luckily, this film does have more of the characters that modern audiences are familiar with, with Dorothy, the Scarecrow, Tin Man, Cowardly Lion, and even the actual wizard. They all have substantial roles. So the film itself is instantly more recognizable as being an adaption of The Wizard of Oz. And yet the movie itself feels like it's kind of meandering through the entire thing with a stupidly long chunk spent with the characters just adrift on this slow moving barge. There's a whole lot of wandering here that feels to little purpose. However, it does have the most special effects for, you know, better or worse. There is an underwater sequence featuring the scarecrow and uh, that one's kind of fun, but also kind of, you know, of course, super cheesy. And the wizard in this version is an actual wizard, so he gets to do a little bit of magic effects, like trapping the witch in a sandwich container. Sandwich container? Get it? And the unintentional horror is back. The scarecrow, much like the patchwork girl, is a pretty questionable design. If they were going for happy and jovial, I think they missed their mark. He landed a little closer to, you know, kill you in the cornfield at night. There's also a scene where the witch has her head cut off and then she lifts it and puts it back on. This is probably one of the more convincing effects, and I can only imagine it kept 1914 kids up at night. Now back to the story, the movie ends with Gloria being recaptured by the King Cruel, and the heroes have to then storm the castle to save her. During the battle, the Scarecrow kind of deliberately, you know, outright murders the king. Because he does so, I guess he gets to be king now. 
That's a good system of government, too. Then the wizard arrives, and the witch is forced to melt Gloria's heart, and Pawn, who is turned into a kangaroo, I probably forgot to mention that part, well, he's turned back into a human again. So it all ends happily ever after, as expected. Now, this last movie I found boring and a mess, but it at least had those recognizable elements from the franchise that could make it an interesting watch for people that just want to check it out. Unfortunately, these movies would be a massive flop and quickly in this studio's short, short history in 1915. It's not a big mystery why they're not well remembered. They were cheap and they often relied on the audience to already know the source material. They were ambitious, but they lacked the big budget of, say, something like a Griffith epic to be able to really bring them to life. But I did think these were really interesting to watch just from the perspective of what children media looked like in 1914. In many ways, what Baum was attempting is what Disney would perfect in about 20 years' time. Though he wouldn't be successful in creating a children media empire like Disney, it was a first attempt at this imperfect model. And it did show that film was developing to the extent that brand name alone could no longer just support it. It required both money and talent, of which Fox Manufacturing Company, unfortunately, had very little. It simply was not equipped to deliver what the times demanded. And I think I'm going to end it there for my look back at the first attempt at Oz adaptions and the short life of Bomb Studio. If you enjoyed this look back, be sure to like and subscribe. I'll see you next time and keep those reels turning. Thank you very much.